As many of you know, at Congregation Beth Adam, we don't read the Torah portion assigned for the particular holiday. Instead, we, the rabbis, choose a different Torah portion each year, which gives us exposure to more breadth as well as depth of biblical stories. This year, we've chosen to read from the 38th chapter of the book of Genesis. It's the story of Judah and Tamar. It's a story that many of you are probably less familiar with than other stories. Part of the reason for that is that it tends not to be a story we teach at Sunday school. And you'll see why as we read it. So kids, please cover your ears. <laughs> it is a story of power, deception, sexuality, sex, incest, illicit contraception, prostitution, forced marriage, intrigue, and action. In other words, this is the Fifty Shades of Grey High Holiday Tara Reader. <laughs> But that is not the only reason that we chose to read this text this year. Oh, it's a good reason. <laughs> it was a primary reason, but not the only reason. It also gives great insight into several biblical topics, modesty, public humiliation, cultic prostitution, and something called Leverite marriage. And if you have no idea what that means, don't worry, most people don't, but you'll learn something today. But even those aren't the only reasons that we chose this story. We also chose it because of the great intertextuality within it. That's a fancy way of saying that a lot of what happens in this story connects linguistically and thematically to other sections of the Torah and specifically the book of Genesis. And yes, those are the things that rabbis get excited about. So I want to say at the outset that this we're going to approach as a literary text just like we always approach Torah at Beth Adam. Lots of places read Torah on the high holidays, but what we're gonna do today is study Torah. Now there are gonna be unfamiliar characters. Unfortunately, three of them, I think, have names that start with the letter J, which makes it even more confusing. If you can't keep track of who's who and what's what at a very detailed level, don't worry about it. What I really want us to do today is step back and see this in the largest sense, not to get lost in the trees, but to see the forest in this text. If it's interesting to you, you can come later this year. I'm going to do an adult ed section session where we review this text in more detail. And I can say some of the things that I can't say today there. Um, so we'll do that on a Sunday morning here. And we'll do a version of that online as well. So today, the goal is really to appreciate the intertextuality, the connections. This story actually connects to a lot of stories we've read here in the last couple of years. Specifically, two years ago, we read the story of Joseph. The story of Judah and Tamar comes right smack dab in the middle of the Joseph story. It interrupts it completely. That's why the editors and redactors who put this text there had to sort of make it look like it fit, even though it didn't really. So we're going to see the efforts that they made to look like it fits. Just to review the Joseph story on one foot to make sure we're all on the same page, Joseph was the beloved son of Jacob and Rachel. He had a coat of many colors, which you may know as the amazing Technicolor dream coat. His brothers were jealous of him. He fueled their jealousy by reporting on some dreams that he had had. They decided to take action and throw him in a pit to sell him to a caravan of Ishmaelites. They then take his coat dip it in the blood of an animal, take it to their father Jacob, and say that Joseph is dead. He's not actually dead, but that's what they want their father to think. Judah, who we're going to read about today, is one of Joseph's brothers. In fact, he's Joseph's brother who had the idea to sell Joseph into slavery. Judah, though, is now not living with his brothers. He's married, and he has three children of his own. Judah's first son is a guy named Er. Er's name, backwards in Hebrew, is the word ra, which means wicked or evil. And stay tuned, because that's going to tell us something about him. Er marries a woman named Tamar. Tamar is a foreigner. She's a Canaanite. Er behaves wickedly. God doesn't like that and kills him off. This is where the concept of Leverite marriage comes in. If a woman is left without a husband and he has not yet given her a male child, the brother of her husband is obligated to marry her and give her offspring. Now that guy, of course, can be married to multiple women, but he has to at least be married to her and have a child with her. That's where Judah's second son comes in. This is a character named Onan. Onan now needs to 
marry Tamar and have a child with her. But apparently he's not interested in that. So he practices an early form of birth control. And if you want to know what the word onanism means, it comes from his name. And if you don't know what it means, please wait till after services to Google it. God does not approve of Onan's interruption of his activities, and so he kills him off. There is now a third son that Judah has. So Tamar has lost two husbands. Judah has lost two sons. There's a third. His name is Shelah. Tamar needs to now marry him, and they need to have a child together. But Judah freaks out a little bit about that. He figures this woman has married two of his sons, and they've died. Why would he give her a third? So he essentially blows her off and says, you know what, Shella needs to grow up a little bit, go back, live with your parents, and when he's ready, we'll call you. That's where our story picks up. Now Tamar has heard that her father-in-law Judah is heading to a sheep shearing festival. But Tassar big day al-Manuta, she takes off her widow's clothing, may Allah, from upon her. Vatkas bat saif batit Allah. And she dresses in a veil. She wraps herself in it. Tamar, up until this point in the story, has been completely silent and passive. We know nothing of her thoughts and feelings. We only know of her situation. But that's all about to change. Batesha b'fetach enayim. She sat at the entrance of a place called enayim asher al derech timnata, which was on the way to a place called timna. These place names are important. Enayim comes from the word for eyes, like seeing. And Timna has to do with concealing. These themes of seeing and hiding, concealing and recognizing are going to be profoundly important, not only in this story, but in the Joseph story as well. She sees that Shela, the third son who she should be married to, has grown up and she has not been given to him as a wife. We can imagine why Judah didn't want to give her the third son, as I said. But I also think that there's more to it, that that's an intentional parallelism between this story and the Joseph story. In the Joseph story, Jacob thinks his son Joseph is dead. The brothers go off to Egypt, and there Simeon, another of Joseph's brothers, is taken prisoner. They are told that they have to go back to Jacob and take little Benjamin, the most beloved son, the one who they had left behind, take him back to Egypt in order to free Simeon. So they go to their father Jacob and tell him this, and he says, no way. He says, Joseph is no more, Simeon is no more, and now you expect me to give you Benjamin? I'm not doing it. We can imagine Judah saying the same thing. Er is no more, Onan is no more. No way that I am giving you my son Shelah. So I don't know, but I suspect in the earliest version of this story, there may not have been three brothers. But that one was added, perhaps, to make it look and feel more like the Joseph story. Vir Eha Yehuda, Judah saw her. Vayeksheva Lazona, and he thought she was a prostitute. We're going to get back to that next week. Stay tuned. He kista paneha, for she had covered her face. She had disguised herself with that veil that I mentioned. We also saw deception 11 chapters back in Genesis 27, a story we read a handful of years ago here, the story of Jacob and Esau. In that story, Jacob wants the birthright, which should have gone to the elder son to Esau. He plots with his uh, mother, Rebecca, to dress himself up, to disguise himself. His father's Isaac's vision is not very good, and so he disguises himself to steal the blessing. So in both stories, we have a strong female character using disguise to trick a man. But yet Aleha el Haderek, Judah turned to her on the street. hava no avo And he says to her, come and be with me, wink, wink. He lo yada ki kalato he, because he didn't know that it was his daughter in law. Kind of feels like a soap opera at this point. And we have this woman who is using clothing for the purpose of deception. She has wrapped herself in the veil so that she won't, he won't know who she is. We also saw clothing used for deception in the Joseph story. There, the coat was dipped in the blood of an animal to show Jacob that Joseph was dead to deceive him. In the Joseph story, Judah was the deceiver. In the Judah and Tamar story, Judah is now deceived. So we see that connection here. But Tomer, Mati Tenli, Ki Tavo Eli. She says, What will you give me if I am with you? Biyomer, Anochi Ashalak, Gedi Izim. He says, I will send you a goat for my flock also reminds us of the Joseph story because there the coat, Joseph's coat, was dipped in the blood of a goat. 
min hatzon from the flock. But Tomer im titen erevon ad shulchacha, and she says, "Well, will you give me a pledge until you send that goat?" But Yomer ma ha erevon asher eten lach, and he says, "What is the pledge that I should give you?" But Tomer. She says, Your seal, your cord, and the staff which you're carrying. It was the modern day equivalent of asking for his social security card, his credit cards, and all of his personal identification. <laughs> and he gave it to her. And he was with her, and she became pregnant by him. So we see in this story a woman who... <coughs> Uh, appeals to a man who is with a man and then takes something from him. She asks for the pledge. We don't know why, although I will tell you they become an important part of the story. This also connects to the Joseph story because in that story when it picks up, Joseph will be living in Egypt in Potiphar's house and there Potiphar's wife will be making advances toward Joseph, which are unrequited and she will essentially rip a piece of his tunic and then accuse him of coming after her. And so in both stories, we see a woman going after a man and taking something, a physical object, as evidence of the encounter. The difference is that Potiphar's wife is seen as a contemptuous, malevolent adulteress in the tradition. And while Tamar is technically an adulteress because she's betrothed to Shella, she's looked much more, uh, she's looked upon in a much better light by the tradition. Vatakom vatelach, and she went on from there. Vatasart saifa me aleha, and she took off the veil from upon her. Vatilbash bigde almanuta, and she once again wore her widow's clothing. So we have this story that completely interrupts the Joseph story. My guess is that they were at one point completely unrelated stories, and that this story was a lineage story, and that's why it had to be included. And then we see the great efforts made to make it fit and to make it make sense. We see the themes that are throughout the stories. There are also specific words that are used in this story and in the Joseph story, and then themes like deceivers and deceptions and all sorts of things. I'm going to skip ahead to the end of the story, even beyond where we're going to get to next week. There we're going to find out that Tamar is pregnant. Well, we already heard that, but we're going to find out that she's pregnant with a son, which is like a biblical reward. It's a great thing to happen to a woman in the Bible, but it's not just one son, it's two sons, and it's not just any son. One of these sons will become an ancestor of King David, a beloved hero of the tradition, and King David is an ancestor of the Messiah. So if you remember the transitive property from seventh grade math, this person is going to be an ancestor of the Messiah. So yes, Judaism does have Messiah concepts. In Judaism, the Messiah is a human. We read about different Messiah concepts throughout different times in Jewish history, but in the book of prophets, we hear quite a bit about them, and we know that they're a human leader who comes in after a time of turmoil and brings in a better time. So we have this story as a result of this union between Judah and his daughter-in-law. We have an ancestor of King David and the Messiah. We know of two other ancestors of King David and the Messiah. One is in the book of Genesis where Lot's daughters disrobe their father, get him drunk, disrobe him, and are with him. A child from that union also becomes an ancestor of the Messiah. In the book of Ruth, later in the Bible, Boaz, Ruth's uh, is with Boaz, and a child from that union is also an ancestor of the Messiah. So we have three women who basically engage in an illicit sexual liaison with a male relative, dupe him, and do it at considerable risk to themselves, and then are rewarded because the Messiah comes from this. I actually don't really have a theory for why this is rewarded. <laughs> um, maybe I'll figure it out by the time we get to adult ed, but it's extraordinary that these characters, once you're seen by the tradition as an ancestor of the Messiah, you have to be included in the text, even if the story of your conception isn't necessarily um, one that the ancestors may have been so proud of. And so we see that this story is essentially a soap opera. It's a very human text. It tells stories about families and relationships, all kinds of things that are in people's minds then and now. It gives us a glimpse into a time. Of course, we can't really understand without a time machine what was going on in our ancestors' minds, but we can begin to peel back the layers and to see the humanness of this text, both in the content 
and in the hands of the editors and redactors who went through later and so seamlessly tried to make this all fit together even when it didn't always fit so well. We see their creativity, which becomes not only something to be proud of their boldness, but a model as we continue to engage in a creative and dynamic Jewish experience today.